Donald and Caulfield. Right. <laughs> yeah, and it even went farther than that. Like, he had a backup copy of Catcher in the Rye, and in that he wrote, From Holden Caulfield to Holden Caulfield. Oh, God. You know, and he said, like, he made sure he's like, he said, I did not believe that I was Holden Caulfield, but more than anything, he wanted to be Holden Caulfield. But isn't that the definition of what a phony is? Is someone who wants to be somebody else? No, no, no. Oh, it's, no, not yo. it's not that you want to be somebody else, it's that you present yourself as somebody that you actually aren't. But isn't that a, isn't that what he's doing with no, Holden Caulfield? He's not presenting himself as Holden Caulfield. He's, he's calling himself Holden Caulfield. Well, he's calling himself he, Holden Caulfield. I Holden think Caulfield. this is a yeah, slippery slope. Like, is he wearing a it top is. hat and getting a monocle? <laughs> it is. That's how I picture Holden Caulfield. Caulfield. I have no idea what he looks like. <laughs> he's a little boy. He's a 16-year-old boy with a t-shirt on jeans. Okay. Yeah. No, so I always pictured him with glasses. Uh, he's got to have glasses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see chucks <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Were those even around then? I guess. Yeah, of Maybe. course. I no. think. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. The history of Converse. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. I'm not. I don't work for Zappos in their about section. <laughs> well, what he wanted to do is he wanted to bleed into the pages of Catcher in the Rye. He wanted to bleed himself with the ink. Like he wanted to be the titular catcher that saves children uh, from falling off the cliff. Yeah, yeah I've been listening to a lot of this recently, the past few months. <laughs> I'd actually listened to this one before at some point. I thought we were almost mature enough to let that word go. I, I, said, said, yeah. I actually put it in there as a trap to see which one of you were going <laughs> to... I thought it. You know I thought it because that is a humorous word because it, had, it has, uh, you know, a word that's in there. That, that's kind of fun. But, uh, yeah. Yes, he said there was a story where it's about children playing in the fields of rye and he made up this kind of allegory about kids falling off the cliff and that he wanted his life to be, he would be at the edge of the cliff catching the kids. But a part of it's also, I think we talked about a little bit last episode, it's an, author, it's an authoritarian point of view. Mm -hmm. It's this idea of I'm the only type, I'm the only person who can help everyone. Yeah. And that uh, the way to help people is to freeze them in the past. Well, and they're not allowed to grow. It's good because it's a bunch of long form content, which is good when you're working on real tedious experiments for a while. Um, like I did <clears throat> a bunch of my mouse EEG surgery experiments listening to the episodes on um, L. Ron Hubbard uh, and a bunch of another experiment listening to the Kuklinski ones, so kinda looking, hoping that there is another series of episodes that they did on another big name person that I haven't heard yet because I haven't heard nearly close to the majority of these episodes, but... I don't know. Oh, mostly played the ones that stood out to me, or seemed interesting. Older, you're supposed to make sure that they never change. I, and Because change is bad. Change means you turn into a phony. The only people that are real are children, even though you eventually will grow up. Right. No That's matter what. Kind of horrifying there. Yeah. Kind of horrifying. Yeah, it's a lot, like a lot of people have that authoritarian streak, especially when they're younger. Sure. You know, where it's like, how men, how is that person going to tell me what to do? I'll tell them what to do. That's going to work out, you know, but meanwhile, there's... <laughs> oh, yeah, the Jonestown one was the first one that I listened to, actually. It's Whopper Wednesday. <laughs> we need to get these Whoppers out. Come on, let's go. <laughs> well, Mark David Chapman, he wanted to blend himself with the ink. He wanted to become Holden Caulfield. Mm. He just had to figure out how. And all this time, something very dark and very troubling was brewing inside Mark David Chapman. Because it wasn't like this new obsession, like, made him happy. Right. It's not like when you find, like, a new video game that you really love and just want to play all the time. Sure. Like, this, it made him miserable. Hmm. So instead of making him happy, the obsession just seemed to give a focus to all the free-floating hatred that Chapman had been storing up for the world not bestowing greatness upon him. Oh. So that hatred now laser focused. Also, yeah, did the Amish oh, Enrique one? Just so happened that the God, I re-listened to the um. Is a boat that Chapman stumbled upon in the same got the Leonard Lake and Charles Ng episode. The book that Mark David again recently was John Lennon 
One oh day god, the voices. Oh, that's actually a great book for an alcoholic to read. <laughs> One They're so good. <laughs> so when Chapman opened that book, he found dozens of photographs of John Lennon's new opulent lifestyle paid for by his near billion dollar share wow. of the Beatles gold mine. So rich. John Lennon, at night Very. in 1980, he was worth 800 million dollars. Oh God, how yeah. don't you just have a bed filled with coke? <laughs> I mean, that's what he did for a while. And then he chased every lifestyle in the world, right? Where he went and did it. Oh, there's a bike there. It's good to know. Yoko made a bunch of records together and then they bought the apartment and he traveled the world and then eventually he lived into this weird reductive lifestyle by 1980 where it was all about like it's an impression that you feel bad at or bad for laughing at but God, it's so good. Um, yeah, God, I'd have to go through the episode list and see which ones I've listened to and which ones I haven't yet. Um, I did that one. Did Dahmer and John Wayne Gacy and I just want to lay in bed with Whoops. Uh who are the other heavy hitters? Uh can't remember. A bunch of them. but I'm always looking for a new, interesting, multi-part series that they have. Child and my wife all nude, and all we do is read the paper and eat little breads, tiny little breads. It's like also being like, you're lying to yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you said he became a house husband okay. for five years. Yeah. Estate, like John Lennon was definitely spending that 800 million that he had. Okay. And as Chapman said, the catcher in the rye was the stove and the linen book. actually played the Rasputin episodes. Was the fire. These drove him insane. Yes. These pictures. He saw this book. Yes, because it was the it was the picture of John It was one of those ones where I wasn't sure if I was actually that interested in Rasputin for like five episodes, so I hadn't listened to it, but craziest building wasn't especially interested in L. Ron Hubbard either, and that was a good series of episodes, so... Guess they made a bunch of episodes for a reason.
can also just put music on if you want. Anyone else who's listening? Just waiting for my hair to dry before I go out. I'm drooling myself. Yeah, I'll listen to that one next. What are you doing? I'll listen to that episode next. No, um, honestly, I was sort of surprised that I hadn't heard of this podcast faster, because I was very much entertained from like the moment I started listening to it, which is very interesting, uh, and has sort of superseded a lot of the other podcasts I've listened to, like entertainment podcasts mostly. Not NPR stuff. Can I not jump out of this? Okay. Oh, I haven't listened to their other stuff. Any of the other podcasts, just this one. Yeah, I listened to all the Jonestown's episode. Yeah, the Jonestown episodes. Uh, that was the first series that I listened to from them. 
You know, I had a bike. Where the hell did I park it? Oh, there it is. I used to listen to, um, a bunch of citation needed, which is different than citations needed, it turns out. And when I found that podcast recommended by somebody, I think they were actually recommending a different podcast, and I just clicked the one with the very, very similar name, which is mostly just like a comedy podcast based on reading Wikipedia articles and then regurgitating them out and making jokes about it. Uh, I don't actually know what Citations Needed is about, but I've been finding myself a lot more interested in listening to last podcast stuff than Citation Needed. It just seems a lot funnier. Also, a lot more content. Right before we uh, recorded the last episode, I went. To, yeah, it's great. I went down to there. It's amazing. It's Jeez. surrounded by these like ancient stone gargoyles. It's got two doormen on staff at all times. There you go. Yeah, it's a beautiful, and it's right across the street from Central Park. Yep. It is amazingly nice. One of the nicest buildings in all of Manhattan, which makes it one of the nicest buildings in the fucking world. There it is. Did you um? Did you look like a crazed stalker when you did it? <laughs> that's the, well, that's what surprised me is still, to this day, there were probably six people up and down. West yeah, I've never known um, how much of the episode is scripted and had, or how much is just ad-libbed. Hmm, I'll take the vector, I guess. Uh... Thought I had... a thing for that. Guess not. No, see, I think, I think citation is needed is different than citation needed, which is different than citations needed, and it's very clear how I could stumble on an entirely different podcast. But still end up liking it. It's a lot of bandages. In fact, I'd never even heard of citation is needed. Yeah, also, all of the uh, impressions in the episodes are real good. That's sort of one of the main draws. It's like, okay, better get a serial killer episode or something with a guy with a very funny voice. a la all of the um, Pee Wee Gaskins episodes. 72nd, taking pictures, they were posing in front of it. And like, it's still to this day, people make, and this was like 2 o'clock p.m. on a Monday. Like, this wasn't a Saturday, or this wasn't a yep. weekend. Like, people are just going there. Dude, I'm telling you, you're an actor, you're in New York, you're skinny, you're lanky, you want to make some money, Go put on some John Lennon gear, go dead, and just have a yes. two bucket there. People will take pictures, yes. give them a buck, 
you will make thousands of dollars a year. You won't have 800 million bucks. You are the person yeah. pretending to be dead John Lennon. But you'll make a couple thousand bucks. You will get a couple of guys showed up as Ringo. And then yeah. you'll be like, can we just stand next to him? Can we just be him. in the picture as well? I love Ringo so much. So Chapman sat there and flipped uh, through the pages of the book and he thought about Oh, I just finished H.H. H. Holmes a couple days ago. The Beatles, all that time and and love, and I used to listen to some of the hilarious world of depression, but I don't know. Started finding it kind of dry at a certain point. Had sung about imagining no possessions. Huh. Then Chapman read an article in which Lennon admitted that all the super obnoxious stunts that he and Yoko would pull throughout the years had all been for publicity. All mm. cynical promotional events just to sell more records. Well, I mean, imagine John Lennon, he's saying, um, imagine you have no possessions because you gave them all to me. <laughs> you gave them <laughs> you know, to like, me. I'm not, this is not about me. This is about you. Like, you don't have a God. You have nothing. But, like, I have a bunch of stuff. Uh -huh. Then Chapman got a copy of Lennon's first solo record and heard Lennon saying that he didn't believe in God or heaven or even in the Beatles. <laughs> it's very, um, it's a provocative song. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fine song. You can see that he wrote it to be specifically upsetting. Yes. Right. Yes, which is part of the uh, infuriating nature of John Lennon. Okay. Oh, yeah, he was he was a real jerk off. Yeah. But, yeah very talented <laughs> Makes jerk sense. Off. Technically the victim in this story. But... He is absolutely the victim. Of course, but of course. That also does not make him a saint. No. You know, that does not make him a martyr or a god or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we are still allowed to say that John Lennon was an infuriating human being. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, he said that the only things that he believed in were himself and Yoko. But, sure. But even... <laughs> right. Sure. Sure. Okay. I mean, I listened to Double Fantasy while researching this episode, and I'm not a fan. <laughs> a couple there, of good songs there, on there. There, are, t there are two good songs. I'm Losing You is a fantastic song. Uh, and sure. Watching the Wheels is a pretty good song. That's something fun to do, too. <laughs> <laughs> but even after all this... The thought of killing John Lennon hadn't entered into Mark David Chapman's mind. He was angry and betrayed by what he thought John Lennon owed him specifically. Right. But he wasn't going to kill him. Okay, well, if he does plan to kill him, he's going to have to go through the little people. He has to go through little people Congress. He better get approval from Congress. Honestly, talk about the the red tape. Yeah, <laughs> it's not easy to do. We're talking war here. You, and talk about the lobbyists from the balls <laughs> saying we need to be jerking off more. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> what finally did it, though, was Sergeant Peppers. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what you call your shits? Sergeant Peppers. Under. Oh, man. Admiral that's Admiral Peppers. <laughs> All right, let's not. But they didn't go to 15 years of shit school to be called Sergeant Peppers. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> that's very... <laughs> you keep them honest. Keep it yes. honest. That's good. Yes. So one night, Chapman was thumbing through his wife's Beatles LPs and happened to pull out her copy, a copy of Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by the Beatles. <laughs> he said he was staring at John Lennon's the noise. cover of that album. Just like he used to stare at his copy of Meet the Beatles when he was a kid, <laughs> and suddenly a thought popped into his head. Wouldn't it be something if I killed John Lennon? Huh. Wouldn't it be something? Huh. <laughs> like, like he came up with the crow nut. Yeah. Like, wouldn't it be something what? if I killed John Lennon? <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny, funny idea. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of those thoughts that should come in and bump right out. But yeah. I guess for him, yeah. it just kind of bounced around. We all have dark thoughts. Of course. We all have very sure. dark thoughts. Like, what if? What if I did that? Yeah. But you don't do it. Every day. Every <laughs> Technically, the therapist that I have is called, it's called intrusive thoughts. Yes. You know, and I have them all the time. Yeah, of course, I'm always driving down the street being like, if I just fucking jerk the wheel and I stop all this whole highway of traffic, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's fun almost to think about, to dabble yeah. in. Oh, yeah. But you just let it go. Yeah, my most intrusive thought is when I'm in the exit row <laughs> on a plane. What would happen if I just pulled that lever? Okay, well, that's good to know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, the horrible thing was, it was pretty easy to kill John Lennon. 
because everyone knew he lived at the Dakota and they knew exactly where to find him coming in and out of his home almost every day because hmm. people would camp out in front of his building waiting for an autograph or just to meet him and to his credit he was actually very gracious to his fans uh, who did that sort of like an occupied John Lennon situation <laughs> that, that's actually very nice though that he would sign autographs that is that's a, let's say yeah. that's very sweet he was really close with his fans by the end because in the end he kind of came back around as he was coming back down to earth a part of it was his like trying to accept everyone like he was he was trying like he would make like fr <sighs> happy saturday I always wondered if you could shoot somebody down in a parachute. I'm sure you probably could, I've just never seen it. Oh, San Diego. It was fun. I wonder if anyone's in here. With some of the super fans that would hang out, like, sort of. Like, they would sit and they would chat. So maybe he could have turned out okay. You know, he went... Shia LaBeouf phase, yes. where he says, I'm disconnected, but then Shia LaBeouf hanging out with everyone watching his own movies, being around <laughs> people. I'm actually a huge yes. Shia LaBeouf fan. I'll defend him. I like him. Yeah, I like him. I like, he's fine. He's just fine. Uh, but yeah, he was, I mean, and also to John Lennon's credit, yeah, like Kinder said, he was uh, pulling back right. from all of those kind of shitty, obnoxious things that he'd done and said over the years, because that little hiatus that he took, it was about a five-year hiatus between uh, between albums, everything slowed down for him. Hmm. Uh, because the thing I understand about John Lennon is that he's been famous since he was 16 years old. Oh, wow. You know, decades. For decades, That's this guy crazy. had been mobbed everywhere he went. Everywhere that is, except New York City. New York does not care. No. 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 People were cool here, you know? Like, I mean, they cared that he was John Lennon, of course, but if they stopped him, it would mostly be just be like, hey, man, love the Beatles. Right. Hey, oh, Jenny, love the Beatles, huh? <laughs> Hey, question. Why are you fucking Yoko? <laughs> All right, I'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye there. Yeah. All right, buddy, you old. Yeah, or like a ribbon. Hey, I like that walrus song you're John. Hey, you looking skinny. Get yourself some pints of pizza. All right, ah. <laughs> I love New York. Yeah, they think like Bruce like, hey John, when the Beatles getting back together. Right. You'd be like, oh yes, very funny, yeah, very funny. Right, yeah, yeah. So that's fine. <laughs> and he'd like stop and like shake their hand. They'd just be like, hey man, I gotta say, look, Revolver changed my life. And he'd be totally cool with it. He'd love it. Okay. And plus, New York City, it was still in its hellhole phase in 1980. So it was kind of like insulated from the rest of the world. People were terrified of New York City. Right. So he pretty much, it's not like now, you know, where fucking anybody can come and it's totally oh, yeah. safe. It's one of the safest cities on the planet. Honestly, the most dangerous thing in New York City, Times Square, Mickey Mouse, Spider-Man, uh, <laughs> the Incredible Hulk, people who are dressed yes. up as the Statue of Liberty, they are not your friends. <laughs> no, don't take pictures with you do them because they will really demand money from Absolutely. You. And never take a mixtape because it <laughs> never, is not never, free. No, what? Never, ever, ever, ever <laughs> take a mixtape. You learned nope. that one. Okay, that's a thing that can happen, I guess.
fast. Yep. This show is also brought to you by AdamandEve.com. Are you? I don't know. Put that all off. They'll even throw a check. He'd have recurring dreams of getting shot and killed specifically. And he'd say he'd sit at his kitchen table and get stoned, and he'd just go on and on about it for hours at a time. Oof. And it also, it wasn't the term murdered, it was the term assassination that shows you where his head was at, mm-hmm. where he viewed himself as an important enough figure that when someone would murder him, it would... And I mean, and technically, yeah. in many ways, he was correct. I, I mean, so, he's yeah. an egomaniac, but he was also like, look what happened in the aftermath of his murder. Yeah. But he viewed himself as like, I mean, I'm an obvious target. Like, I'm right. like, if someone kills me, I, I, it will mean it will be a poetic death to many people. You can't blame the guy that people are following him around like he's a Pied Piper yeah. uh, since he's 16 years old. Of course, that's going to go to your head and think, well, I'm a little bit more special than the average Joe. Well, it's not just that. He also knew that the FBI had a file on him. He knew that J. Edgar yeah. Hoover had been following him for years. Because, like, who he knew that, that... Who is that really weird bumpy guy in the dress behind me? <laughs> uh, is that J. Edgar Hoover? Name's J. Edgar Hoover. You like my heels? You know I can <laughs> jump in them. I, am, uh, I have incredible calf strength. Anyways, got an eye on you, mister. <laughs> <laughs> so really, I mean... Back then, uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, like, they were putting John Lennon on the same level as Martin Luther King Mm -hmm. or, like, other people that, you know, were agitating against the establishment. Like, John Lennon was, as far as the U.S. government went, right there up with them. It's just so funny. The FBI had a list. and be like, what's their crime? They'd be like... They want peace. <laughs> They've been talking about, like, this peaceful resolution of race wars yeah, and things like that. Yeah, because peace is for commies, Ben. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I bro. didn't realize that. Yeah, and communists, are, they're loosening the glue of this country. Oh, okay. That's what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it was. That it wasn't peace, man. It was about the communists coming in, getting the agitators all going, because if the agitators were going, that meant that we were going to start fighting each other, fighting against oh. the status quo, and that was going to rip the country apart. John Lennon, that communist with $800 million. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, the great th- and the amazing thing is, is that the Russians actually listened to all the stuff that they were talking about way back then, uh, kind of put a spin on it, and then today actually put it into practice. Oh. But they do it through uh, Facebook ads. Oh. And it ripped oh. the country apart that way. Fun. So, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, it's cool. incredibly easy, oh, actually. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredibly easy, yeah. And it wasn't through, like, good music. It was uh, through Stupid. social media. Stupid. Really not getting anything all that good. Eh. 
Yeah, whatever. Where did I park? Literally a cartoon frog. Treating us like a bunch of fucking uh, rats in a maze. Yeah, yeah that's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a yeah. bunch of programmable drones <laughs> that are attached to our phones <laughs> like it's crack cocaine. Okay. Only if it didn't work, then I would blame them. Well, the most ironic thing about all this is that John Lennon, he always thought he was going to get assassinated for his political beliefs. Mm -hmm. You know, because he was up there with Martin Luther King right. Jr. He was up there uh, with, or he believed he was up there with like people like Gandhi. Bobby Kennedy. That Bobby group. Kennedy, yep. all that. He thought that that's what he was going to get assassinated for he thought he definitely thought that but in the end he was killed because someone believed he'd abandoned his ideology crazy you know it'd be exact yeah. opposite interesting and that person mark david chapman saw lennon as no more than a stand-in for the pimp and catcher in the ride that holden caulfield had fantasized about killing mm -hmm. but the difference here was that chapman was actually going to do it yeah Chapman was going to enact what he came to think of as Chapter 27 of Catcher in the Rye, going one better than J.D. Salinger. But it's it, the fantasy is what's a truly frightening. Mm, right. Yeah, he believed that when he shot John Lennon, he would curl up into a ball next to Lennon's body and disappear into the ink of Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> That was his, that was, no shit, that was his plan. Just cut to him getting hit with billy clubs by the NYPD. <laughs> Just be like, I am not melting away. Um, yeah, that's, that's what, that is what happened. And a part of it, it's, it's weird. Over the course of reading uh, Let Me Take You Down and researching into his book, um, at first, you know, like you laugh about the fantasy and stuff and all stuff, but it, it's actually starting to become very frightening for me. Mm. Like uh, that Mark David Chapman did this, because then it's also the thing where it's like, uh, I'm going to say maybe like, there's a solid 15% of people that are walking around just thinking the same shit. Oh, yeah, of course. But they just don't kill you. You yeah. know what I mean? They just don't kill you because they're just not going to because their their specific fantasy is like, I'm going to take a shit over here at the salad bar in the sizzler. <laughs> like, I'm going to do a ride of the Cobb salad, and right. then I become one with the corn fritters. Like, I will <laughs> dissolve into a corn fritter. When the family of eight comes in and be like, mm, man, these corn fritters today are tasty. <laughs> Saltier than usual, but also like a corny taste. <laughs> Well, before Mark David Chapman could actually take care of the phony, he had to prepare himself. So on October 23rd, 1980, Chapman quit the maintenance job he'd been working and signed out with the name John Lennon, officially beginning his quest to assassinate the former Beatle. Okay. And amazingly, unbeknownst to Chapman, as this is pointed out in Let Me Take You Down, John Lennon was starting something new as well. And that day, John Lennon released the single <sighs> Why? That's like starting over ahead of the release of Double Fantasy, his first album in five years. Just like starting over was the song? Yeah. And so maybe that goes to what you were talking about earlier, a rebirth yes. of who he was as a person. Oh, it was very Trying much to connect voice. again. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, it was like purposely put together. It was a whole thing. It was his, he was his return. And then Chapman, it kind of got folded in, too. It's another synchronicity that he viewed as like, oh, I'm going to serve my purpose here. Well, that's the thing, though, is that I don't think Chapman ever knew about that. It's Let so weird, though, then, if he did, so he weird, didn't. Yeah. It shows just so much how... It's such a fucked-up coincidence. It's, it's such a, like... Their, their lives are melding together, um, not on purpose. No, right, not at all. Because Chapman was in Hawaii. You know, and yeah. that, and it wasn't like it is today, yeah. where you know something is released worldwide at all at the same time, where you know we're hearing the same shit that they're here in like Korea. Yep. Like things had to travel. Yeah, I think in Hawaii, in the 19, 1980 Hawaii, I think the best music was coconuts, <laughs> and it was just people <laughs> yeah, slamming yeah, yeah, them yes, together. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, they had ukuleles. Oh, yeah, they had, uh, right. they had uh, there's been Zoe Deschanel's in Hawaii since the beginning, but they weren't Zoe Deschanel's. They were traditional Hawaiian music. Yeah. No one should pay, play the ukulele unless they're over 350 pounds, because that is adorable. Yeah. 
Well, back in Hawaii, Chapman was calling on Satan to give him strength to carry out his plan. Mm. I wish it was more metal than this, but it's not. It's not. You know what I mean? Like, it's not. I mean, like, it's sad when you're asking Satan for help, because he's like, what? <laughs> like, stop it. Stop asking me for help. Do you know anything about Satanism? You're not supposed to ask me for help. I mean, I don't know. Was he going... Like, uh, was he like painting himself all up? Was he naked or he anything naked. like that? He, he was, was always naked. Yeah, he was naked. naked. Yeah, Did he, he have like an apocalypse now moment where he just like <laughs> flipped immediately? Well, he did destroy his wife's record player once when he wasn't working properly. He was trying to put together and he destroyed it. At this point, he's become a terror in the house, mm -hmm. uh, muttering to himself, sitting in the kitchen, screaming at his little people, like doing like his pitches <laughs> at the little people. Good God. Yeah, Chapman, he'd get naked, he'd put on Beatles records and beg Satan to help him. All, and that's the thing, all while he's doing this, he's doing this in the middle of the night. All while his, while his wife is trying to sleep in the next room, just cowering under the covers. Oh terrifying. my god, horrible. And to the best of Chapman's memory, this was one of his chances. Yeah, they have a series on Charles Manson. Hear me, Satan. Accept these pearls of my evil and like my Three or four rage. episodes. Accept these things from deep within me. In return, I ask only that you give me the power to kill John Lennon. Give me the power of darkness. Give me the power of death. Let me be a somebody for once in my life. Give me the life of John Lennon. I can't give you the power, but uh, there's a thing called a firearm. <laughs> and you wouldn't believe how easy it is to use. So fast. He got it. He got it so fast. Yeah, he did. Now, later, Chapman would say that it was silly to think that Satan or demons yeah. had possessed him. That's the yeah. silly yeah. part. Yeah, it is silly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the Donner Party episodes were also good. You know why it's silly? Why? Because demons can't possess Christians, Ben. See, citation needed. Cit yeah, citation needed. The other podcast that keeps getting confused did an episode on the Donner Party, but the one that last podcast on the left did was so much better. Okay. Still to this day, he he holds on to that bullshit. Okay. Because it's just a, another. It's a, because Mark David Chapman, he throughout his entire life always take like he acts like he's taking responsibility, but there's always that one little thing that he can put in front, right. like that he can put in front and say like, yeah, it's my hey, fault. I take total responsibility, except for this one little thing. Right. right. If this one little uh, thing wasn't really here, though, but at the same time. So I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, but at the same time, it's not my fault. But you know, but it's also whatever's the newest story that will get him attention. Mm -hmm. Right. What we'll learn too, like especially post murder Chapman, is that he's such a fucking little piss bucket. 
baby. <laughs> everything, everybody says me, 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 me. Everybody needs to pay attention, so he's constantly changing his narrative to get people to talk to him. So this whole thing started with him nude, his dick is banging around on the record machine. I don't know about banging. And, well, who knows what he no, did with that. He probably no. put it on there a couple of times. <laughs> let it flip around a little bit. And it was all these chants to Satan, huh? Uh-huh, and that's what he said. He said that he needed the power of Satan to pull the trigger. Mm. And that's who actually did it. The power oh, of I see. oh, he damn, didn't do it. Damn. I see. If you really want to figure out how he killed John Lennon, you got to follow the money. And you know who are the people that were in charge of the money? It was the little people. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, because there's a shit ton of logistics to figure out here. Okay. You know, you can't just yeah. call on Satan and Satan's going to transport you to New York City. Right. And get you a gun and all that shit. Nah, there's, nah, a, yeah, there's planning that goes into all this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Satan's not a fucking travel agent. No. <laughs> like, he's not here doing all your shit. Satan's not your quick and account. No. That's what you have the little people for. Ah. Yep. So the little finance minister helped him work out all the monetary problems of getting the means to kill and the places to stay, plus a little walking around money without asking any questions. But after he got all that worked out... Mark decided he had to come clean. Well, because he couldn't tell them directly that he was going to kill John Lennon. When he had the meeting with them, he had to start with, I'm thinking about taking a little vacation to New York. And I mean, when he started, he first said that to his wife, and she's like, why? And he's like, fuck you. Like, I go where I gotta go. And then he has to go crawl into the little people to be like, I need X, Y, Z money for hotel. And the, th and the whole time the little people are like, but why? <laughs> like, why? Like, they're What's giving him, like, the hard turn. And then he's like, mm, I guess I should maybe tell them what I'm trying to do. Yeah. He called together his entire cabinet and told them that he finally decided to be someone. Oh, cabinet can fit in the cabinet. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Indian in the cupboard, but it's Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell. Yeah. <laughs> Early. You know what I'd like to do with that cabinet is just fucking throw it out a window out onto the street from a five-floor building. <laughs> it's been it's really fun. fun since he got into politics. Oh, yeah. It really Love is. It. That's, yeah. that's fun. Yeah. So Mark David Chapman, in his meeting with the little people, and how he would meet with the little people is he had said he had this huge television screen that he would appear on while all the little people would sit like it was like the United Nations. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Well, he said that someone from his childhood, the man whose songs he'd sung to them, his subjects, had hurt him greatly. No, they're little people. It's an imaginary group of people in his head that he would defer to. Which would have somehow been better in Chapman's mind. Okay. British people are supposed to live in castles. I guess so. I understand so. <laughs> Yes, and British bands are all supposed to live in castles together. Ah, it makes sense. So Chapman told the little people that all this put together had ruined his life. Oh. John Lennon had ruined his life. Oh. He told them that because of all this, he had decided to kill John Lennon, and he wanted their help. But think about this, Kissel. We've all, I mean, Marcus, you were there too, and Kissel and I also previously, we've been a part of pitches that are going south. Oh, it's right. Sure. First poop of the day. You know, yes. <laughs> Do you remember? Yep. And you know what happens is, is that they start looking at their phone. Right. They start leaning back. They start like, Can you want a cup of water? Like, they, they start disengaging. The little people are starting to give them the stiff arm. Oh. Like, he's trailing, and he's weirding out the fantasy people <laughs> that he created to... Do his budget. Right. <laughs> He's weirding them out. They're like, huh, I don't know, Mark. That sounds kind of crazy. <laughs> what do you think, uh, 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 Lord of the Feet? What do you think, dude? How, how's those New Balances doing? And he's just like, New Balances are fine, but I'm going to have to give a nay to killing John Lennon. And they're like, yeah. Tough crowd, tough crowd. Yeah. After a quick got little, vetoed, they huh? had a quick little bull session, and they came back and said, like, Mark, listen, uh, we have to respectfully decline. Wow. Uh, this program this plot seems to be all about destruction it's only going to destroy your life and we as people who have sworn to protect you cannot take a part in this we cannot stop you but we cannot help you all right there it is and so they left they left the boardroom the boardroom disappeared meanwhile he's in the kitchen doing all this to himself and gloria's kind of hearing it on the other side it's just still going i have no will my swiffering has never been more complete. <laughs> and she's just swiffering and swiffering. Everything is gleaming clean. What a nightmare for her. So Chapman accepted their decision, wished them the best, and in yet another coincidence. 
Oh, you got lucky. Robin Ono. And on the next day, Mark David Chapman was on a plane to New York City. But this first attempt didn't work out. He wandered to New York and actually saw David Bowie. I didn't what? Elephant Man, which was crazy. There's a person here? Oh, nice. Mm. Yeah, I mean, all my equipment's really bad, so... Hope nobody notices me. Yeah. Poor dude, I wasn't even trying to hit him. Oh, I don't have a mouse pad, I just use my desk. That's why it sounds all scratchy. There's a dude over there. Ow. Hey. Stop. So awesome. And then he went to see George C. Scott in a play. You could just do that back then? Dude, back oh, then. Yeah. It's like, yeah, oh, I'm going to go see the guy who was in Patton and Dr. Strangelove. I'm just going to go see him <sighs> in a play. Just going to wow. do that. Yeah, cool. And then I'm just going to go see David Bowie be the elephant man. Now it's like Jim Parsons playing Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Dr. Seuss, the revisionist yeah. musical where it's all fucking dark. And you're like, I don't give a shit about this. Yeah. Or like Anastasia on Broadway where they cut out Rasputin completely, they apparently. Did. Whatever. Really? Yeah. No, that's what I hear. That's what I hear. Because huh? I was thinking about going. I was thinking about going. Well, you just I lost yourself a customer, Broadway. <laughs> you just lost yourself a customer. <laughs> that's very good. <laughs> Let them know. They just lost your $13 back, 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 back seat to Anastasia. <laughs> well, Mark David Chapman, instead of enjoying what had to have been these amazing performances, he said all he could think of as he was watching these legends was how easy it would be to pull out his gun and shoot any of them. Jeez. That's all oh I can my think god, about. that's so right. fucking scary, man. That's so scary. But the, no, he didn't think about the little people veto, though, huh? Uh, well, after the little, little people left, he's like, all right, fuck you. I'll do it on my own. Look I'll at that I'll Saturday Night Massacre, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem was, at that time, and probably not now either, you couldn't buy bullets for a 38 special here in New York City. Really? No, absolutely Oh, yeah. No. When he called the gun shop looking for it, the guy was like, Are you trying to buy bullets for 38 Special? Go fuck yourself. You're not buying them from me. Like, people <laughs> oh, were, like, it, very intense about it. While he was able to bring his gun, uh, he didn't have anything to shoot these people with. He should have gotten the bullets in Hawaii. Yeah. That's why instead of having gun control, we should have bullet control. <laughs> and we should Come make on, the guys. plane out of the black box, <laughs> and one day they're just going to bake our head in the cheese. <laughs> yeah, come on now. Yeah, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> so, to solve this problem, Mark David Chapman took a flight down to Atlanta 
and under the guise of just a nice little visit to an old friend, he picked up five hollow point bullets. Okay. Not only say give me five hollow points, which he gave it to him, he then trained him how to use the fucking gun. They Perfect. went they went shooting immediately. Because it's Atlanta, so it's fun in it's fun in games, and then he's just like don't you do anything nefarious with them bullets now. Right. And he's been like, never, never in a thousand years. I just collect them. I draw little faces on them. You know, I speak to little people in my brain. <laughs> Can I get the bullets back? <laughs> All the targets uh, looked like John Lennon, you know? Yeah. Kind of wild. And he told his friend, like, hey, yeah, I'm going to New York City. I've been in New York City. I'm coming down for this visit. Now I'm going back to New York City. i got to have something to protect myself with. Right. Uh, and the guy's like, oh, yeah, of course, man has a right to bear arms. Here's a handful of hollow point bullets. Okay. So Chapman returned to New York fully loaded, and as a further coincidence, just another one, he yeah. read an Esquire article on the plane criticizing John Lennon for his hypocritical upscale lifestyle. Oh, nothing like Esquire to bring people down to earth. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And of course, like, you know, John Lennon took this as a sign. What he was doing was right. He even went to the Dakota, where Lennon lived, and made friends with the doorman scouting out the scene. But one night, Chapman went and saw the Mary Tyler Moore, Timothy Hutton movie, Ordinary People. Oh. Very sad. Yes. Very, well, very sad Isn't movie. that one of the saddest movies of all time? It's uh, like... I'd say. When I looked it up on IMDb, uh, when checked it out, uh, it said, you may also like Terms of Endearment. Okay, good. Great. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Who likes that? <laughs> I don't know, but... Jackie. Jackie. It's so These sad. are Jackie movies. Oh, okay. Yeah, Jackie likes sad movies. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, Timothy Hutton's character in Ordinary People touched Mark David Chapman in such a way that he called his wife and told her he was coming home. Oh. This motherfucker identified with everything. If he saw, I bet you he'd see a commercial for, the, for bananas and be like... That banana woman with all the fruit in her head. <laughs> That's me. I, yeah. I get her. I get where she's coming from. I, too, have a burden on my mind. <laughs> but it was like when it cuts to Timothy Hutton, like, he identified with Timothy Hutton, who's a suicidal character in that movie, and it's just like, okay, sure, it's another another one that's you. Mm. Everybody's you. Yeah, he, said he looks for... Uh, identity and everything because he has none himself and because he's a narcissist he sees everything as for him and that's why he bought hollow point bullets because he himself was hollow <laughs> psychological coincidence but also a theory that is working why not <laughs> so mark david chapman spent two more days in new york still going to the dakota and staring at the building while listening to todd runkren on his walkman <laughs> Then, oh, oh, man, poor Rundgren. Oh. He, did not, he did not want to be a part of this. Of course not. No, Rundgren's actually <laughs> no. a good dude. Like, Yeah, he produced uh, the New York Dolls' first album. He produced Bad Out of Hell. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, this guy, he knew. He knows what he's doing. Todd Rundgren did not deserve any of this. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> so, And neither did John Lennon, by the way. Of course. Yeah. So on November 11th, almost two weeks after Mark David Chapman had left Come Pride, on, they fixed it. he called his wife and confessed. Like, he told her, I came to New York to kill John Lennon. But, oh. <laughs> but like, what's the response? Like, oh, okay. Uh, oh, good. 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 Bad. <laughs> and he said, but he said, but your love has saved me. So I'm oh, coming home. great. Okay. So he came back the next day, threw his copy of Catcher in the Rye in the garbage chute, and decided it was time to put the whole I'm gonna kill John Lennon thing in the past. That's the, put that in the past. Thank you so much for listening to the last podcast and left. This has been a great episode. <laughs> um, thank you so much for giving to the Patreon, right? Is yes, it, what do we do here? yourselves, everyone, for installations. That's the story. <laughs> and that does, that did make me think, actually. Like that line, like when I find, found that out, how many fucking people come this close? Oh, my God. I don't want to think about yeah. it. It's horrifying. Yeah. It, it, it is deeply horrifying. I think it happens... I, I would say it happens quite a bit. Yep. I'd say that there are a lot of people, you develop an obsession, and then normally what you hope is that there's some kind of safety net, right? Or that some loved one can reach out, that you have enough connections to the real world that someone can come and save you, right. which is a thing that we're kind of having a problem with mental health in this country to begin with. Man, watch the do HBO documentary, The Dangerous Son. No, don't. <laughs> Don't watch it. Don't. Oh, we have a recommendation, anti-recommendation. I'm stuck in the you middle. Don't like, you didn't like it? No, man. Oh.
Is it bad? No. It was horrifying. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's obviously very, it's very horrifying, but I'm saying, like, but it's important to realize, I mean, like, the gap in mental health care in this country uh, is really going to result in a lot of dangerous people. Yeah. And, well, thank God it hasn't yet, you know? <laughs> that is what's so good, is that it, so far it's been peaceful. Um, no, it's a, it is a very good documentary. It's okay. a very well put together All documentary. Right, it like, it, uh, it links uh, some of these guys that are, like, you know, have horrible mental health problems uh, you know where it's like most of these people are fine most of them don't do anything but some of them are adam lanza sure. some of them are uh james holmes mm -hmm. uh, some of them are mark david chapman yes it's the same shit yeah where and we need to get these people help and yep. if we don't then bad shit is gonna happen all right and our last sponsor for today's show is casper mattresses not to mention the night risk grease to the sand fly so Mark David Chapman came back. When did what come out? This episode? In the trash. Uh, I'm gonna put it all behind me. 2016. Five, month, an itch showed up in the back of Chapman's mind. Uh oh. He called this itch the child. <sighs> nah, it's not that so old. <laughs> never let a child itch you as an adult. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're over the age of 18, that? never let a child yeah, do that. Don't, that's not good. Chapman said that the child was the driving force behind this entire plot. Oh. And it doesn't really make sense because it's just an no. excuse. I mean, this is like, right. it's the same type, type of shit that Ted Bundy used to say with the entity. Mm. Is that it wasn't Bundy who did all this. It was the entity mm. who did all this. That's what I do when I eat a full pizza. I say, that's the blob. Uh, that is not me. That is great movie, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. In Chapman's mind, the child was the one who saw John Lennon as a toy that had changed over the years. And the child had thrown a tantrum because of it. But it was the adult that had to do all the practical work. Oh. If you have a young Sheldon up here before you and <laughs> call a other grown man a broken toy that you need to fix with a gun, <laughs> don't listen. Do not listen. Yes. Full stop. Uh, the child was the one who had asked for Satan to pull the trigger. The child who brought the demons to hell. It's like the baby from fucking Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> Got the Who Framed, Who Framed Roger Rabbit reference in. That's good. Contract yes. complete. <laughs> he said, but it was the adult that gave the child the gun. It's the same shit as Ted Bundy, because Ted Bundy used to say that it was the entity that made him you know, kidnap and rape these women, right. but he was the one who killed them uh, to cover up the crime. You know, and Gacy used to say the same type of shit. What was it that Gacy got? Didn't he just call it that other guy? <laughs> okay. That is so Chicago. That other yeah, guy that made other me do guy, it. Yeah, you know the other guy. But Chapman said that on the first trip to New York City, the child stayed in Hawaii and oh. just didn't show up to play the game. That's good. Cheap tickets. Never take a child on... Also, never take a child on vacation in, into New York City. No. Even oh, in, in, nightmare. nightmare. A physical child will not enjoy New York City. No, no. Disney World, when they're kids, when they're teens, maybe lug them around New York City. Maybe. <laughs> I gotta say, I was on the plane back from Los Angeles. Thank you for coming out to the Echoplex. Great shows. Awesome. And there was a dog... And it was a problem because it was wearing a diaper. Uh -huh. And I was like, that's a, that's oh. a big pee dog. That dog is going <laughs> to jump all over. And sure enough, the entire flight, it just smelled kind of like a mild amount of dog crap. So I, I love dogs. <laughs> but, you know, if it can't handle it, also maybe take that into account. And so since the child didn't come along on the trip to New York, the adult went home. But a couple of weeks later, the child came back while Chapman was driving his car. And the child promised that this time, Problem playing podcasts while playing this game. Always cuts off right when you gotta do something. Spoilers: John Lennon gets shot. you haven't been paying attention.
yeah, sorry. Did he die from the shot? Tune in next time. For the thrilling conclusion of do what they had gone there to do the first time. So he's been there twice now. He's only been there once. Only been there once. Okay. Yes. I see. And so Chapman told his wife that he was going to go back to New York because he had an idea for a children's book or something. And yeah, he just skipped bullshit excuse. He's yeah. like, I'm just going back to New York, even though you just went to New York to try to kill John Lennon and you didn't go. Right. She, and, and you didn't do it. So you uh, came back. So now she's just like, oh, okay, and totally bought it again. She's yeah. like, yeah, just go. See you soon. Also, an idea for a children's book, that comes from Hawaii. <laughs> you don't have ideas for children's books in New York. You have ideas for much more, much darker crime dramas. Yeah, yeah. Hawaii's got great, I mean, like, you go, you write it, it's like, uh, Hakanaka, the mischievous koi. That's oh. a great children's oh, book yeah, centered in Hawaii. Well, Mark David Chapman arrived back in the city on December 6th, 1980. That day, he arrived outside of Dakota and made friends with two big linen fans who become like kind of fixtures outside of John Lennon's house. And they, I mean, they were there so much that like actually some people in Dakota they'd send them on errands. Hmm. Okay. So look, yeah, it was like two sweet ladies, mm -hmm. and they would sit, they'd hang out there all the time. And I mean, obviously, they probably got a little bit wrong with the old Bing Bong up top. Sure. The fact that they just sit out there all the time, but they were sweet enough, right? Yeah. This is also like 1980. I mean, these are people that aren't quite done with the 60s yet. Uh, they're holding on to them. possibly can and the best they can do is hanging outside of John Lennon's house. Okay. But that's another interesting thing about Mark David Chapman. Even though that he'd been spending his nights naked shouting about Satan <laughs> while playing the Beatles LPs at 45 RPM, <laughs> he was not a shambling mess all the time. He was not a shambling mess when he arrived in New York. sable jacket he looked really good because he had a concrete understanding that if he looked crazy no one would let him near the dakota that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah and most people that talked to him they actually said he was likable 
uh, they didn't mind having oh, yeah. him around. So we didn't have his well, uh, I'm unique shirt on or whatever <laughs> like that. Just no, started screaming. He had people. it on underneath his clothes. Oh, okay. uh, he's been saying it so much it became like his mantra. Um, he said he would turn up the Southern. They said when you're in New York City, is that because he was from Atlanta, is that when he would go, which is kind of where the voice even comes from, is that his friendly little Southern persona where you go be like, well, y'all, this is the biggest city I've ever been in. <laughs> it shows how sneaky a Southerner can be. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Absolutely a oh. sneaky Southerner. Yeah, if you want people to underestimate you, just turn on your Southern accent. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. hi. How y'all doing over here? Over to Port Authority. Wham, 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 just look at that session. You'll just say the most atrocious thing. We, we got to incarcerate half the country and be like, well, look at that little charming guy. Isn't that fun? Well, there were no. that first day so Chapman checked into room 2730 at the Sheraton and went to sleep the next day he woke up went out and bought a copy of Double Fantasy it's Lennon's new album he then walked through Central Park and New York City subconsciously following in the footsteps of Holden Caulfield okay but he realized he didn't have a copy of Catcher in the Rye, so he went into a bookstore to pick one up. This is his, like, fourth copy of this damn book. Yes. <laughs> Maybe fifth. Okay, so he's like J.D. Salinger, like, loves him as a client, <laughs> as, a, as, as a reader, but not as a person. Mm -hmm. Yes. But perhaps tellingly, Chapman forgot about all that when he spotted a postcard featuring a scene from his favorite movie. Try to guess what it is, Ben. Favorite movie? Uh, Annie Hall. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> Interesting choice, though. Yeah, just, uh, give him one more shot. Uh, it's older. It's older. Uh, I'm going to say uh, Singing in the Rain. Actually, you're not far off. Wizard of Oz. No kidding. Well, he also identified with Dorothy. Before, he uh, he went through a whole Wizard of Oz phase where he said he was Dorothy, and then eventually he said that his persona was a mix of all four of them. So this is another one. But, that of, is the, but this is me. It's like when my that's mom the movie. went from... My mom went from collecting things shaped like hearts the things shaped like pelicans to snowmen, right. and now my mom connect, collects witch figurines. And that's what she does. <laughs> but that is the whole point of that movie, is you're supposed to relate to every one of those characters as a little piece of you. Mm -hmm. It's the whole point. But, but he saw it as they're an amalgamation of me. Yeah, buddy. He, he was... I don't think it, he, he's the only one who existed, Kissel. You know, see, you're okay, not yeah. important. It's just him. No, I know. I just, all right. Yeah, the whole world exists for him. Okay. And, 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 and that's the uh, that's kind of the the conflict is the whole world exists for him and yet the world isn't doing what he believes it should be doing. Well, you know what? Talk to the little people. Get things done. <laughs> they left. Yeah, it's they ran out. He fucked up the pitch and they all left. <laughs> oh man. Well, besides just buying the Wizard of Oz postcard, he also bought the January 1981 issue of Playboy, which featured an inner. I just got done killing this other guy and I just ran up behind him with a bike. Bummer. Oh, Jesus. How long was that happening? Why is my gun pink? If I hit control, 
Oh. Alt shift click. It doesn't do anything. Probably because it was somebody else's and I just picked it up. God. There's a guy... This guy here was shooting at that guy here. And then I just ran into him. With... My bike. And... Hey. My bike's still okay? Uh, not really. Okay, who's on the cover there? There's more DR. I don't know what that means, but okay. Paradise bottom. Oh no, that's not what I want. Where's my skirt? Edition. Wait, I thought there was a of, uh, uh, NSU. a buggy. Oh, there it is. Looks like it's Barbara. Bach. Barbara Bach. What a weird coincidence. Barbara Bach from Daisy Duke. Daisy Duke, who was on uh, uh, what's the spot? Duke's a hazard. Duke's a hazard. Barbara Bach is currently on the new season of Works Cooks in America that I'm locked in for watching for some reason. That's synchronicity. Really? <laughs> Who knew? Worst cook, huh? So Chapman bought both the Playboy and the Wizard of Oz postcard. <laughs> okay. Uh, but the Playboy had the added bonus of putting him in the mind for a little hired company. Oh my goodness. He called an escort, but didn't have any sex because, you know, the whole warm wetness thing. Uh, yeah, I made him scared. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So he just gave her a massage. And uh, the thing that was really fucked up is that he called this escort and she walks in and she's wearing a green dress, which is the same exact color of the dress that the escort wore that Holden Caulfield met while in Catcher in the Rye. And so it's it's another one. It's another one where it's just like, what the fuck? That she walked in in a green dress. It's the same story. He gave her the massage. Yeah. He's the escort. <laughs> I don't even understand. Like, why did he just put an ad out being like, I'll massage you for 50 bucks? He could make some money. Yeah. I'd actually I'd like to ask the sex workers that listen to our show if that would upset you or not. Because I feel like it's kind of nice, but in the end, you're paying to be able to touch a woman without her yelling. I think that's a hard one. I don't think that. I think they're experienced. They're, they've seen it all. Yeah, and he also called and said, like, hey, do you think you can send someone who, like, doesn't speak English very well, like, someone who doesn't talk? He's like, yeah, I don't want to talk to him at all. Like, I just wanted to come. Because he told them uh, she came in and he said, I don't want you to talk. I just want you to be here because tomorrow is going to be a very difficult day. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So that next day, on December 8th, Mark David Chapman woke up and knew that that was the day. But before he left the room, he had to prepare. First, he practiced his quick draw in the mirror for a couple of hours. <laughs> you know what the problem is? That it's funny for a while, but it's also Travis Bickle. Yeah. It's Travis Bickle did the same thing. So it's like, it's funny to watch this fat dude do it, but then knowing that he's going to go. Right. 
it is. kill somebody afterwards is immediately becomes terrifying. Yeah, I know. It's just another. It, they're all just like they're just so pathetic, you know. It's yeah. like okay, so he's practicing his quick draw. Yeah, he practiced his quick draw, and every time he pulled the gun out, he clicked the trigger five times. Like, tick, 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 tick. And after he was satisfied with his gunplay preparation, I feel like he just also wants like a Red Rider BB gun for Christmas. <laughs> he yeah, does. he's got to kill he Black does. Bart. Like. <laughs> So after he was satisfied with his gunplay preparation, he looked at himself in the mirror and said, quote, The catcher in the rye of my generation, chapter 27. Then he laid out a Mark David Chapman shrine on top of the hotel dresser, dedicated to himself and the things he loved. Oh, good. He included a passport, a picture of him working with Vietnamese refugees, and a letter to one of his supervisors at the YMCA. And a really small, small, strangled little person from his Congress who, <laughs> who defied him multiple years ago. He strangled him, strangled him, and put him down. Now, along with all that was a Todd Rundgren 8-track, a Bible open to the Gospel according to John, with linen written in next to John. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, you see what he did? <sighs> yeah, yeah, I got it, yeah. And in the middle of it all, he laid the Wizard of Oz postcard he bought the day before. It was a nice little scene showing Dorothy and the Cowardly Lion. What a dweeb. I also put a plate of eggs and bacon because breakfast is the most important <laughs> meal of the day. And I want anybody to see this to be reminded by it. That is a good reminder, yeah. He then walked in and out of the room a few times to make sure it was going to look right when the cops came in, rearranging it just a little bit each time for a maximum Mark David Chapman effect. <sighs> well, because okay. it's all about him, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about, because he knows they're going to come and search the hotel room looking for stuff, and he wants to make sure he can set the proper story. Right. So after he was satisfied, he left the room to meet his destiny. First, he stopped at a bookstore and picked up a copy of Catcher and a pen opened the cover Jesus. and wrote on the first page this is my statement underlying the word this and then signed it Olden Caulfield the catcher on the rack okay he then went to the Dakota and started his day-long stakeout armed with a copy of catcher a copy of double fantasy and his 38 special loaded with five hollow point bullets mm. and it's sitting in the pocket of his jacket the entire day like, right. it's sitting there. He had dressed himself in many, many layers. I mean, obviously, it was still cold out, so it worked. But he was trying to hide the gun. But his hand was on the gun all day. Right. Waiting to go. And no one thought this was suspicious, even, like, pacing around? Or was he, like, dressed like a bush? <laughs> like, how he was he... with a bunch of people. There was a bunch of people standing there, too. I see. Okay. Yeah, and there were other guys. Like, there was a guy there that was a photographer uh, that pretty much made his living harassing John Lennon. I, oh, uh, and guys. so, like, Mark David Chapman made friends with him. Okay. And well, yeah. that sounds like a good yeah. acquaintance for him to make. Yeah. Like, and he, he, uh, yeah. Annoying. And the other thing that he did is he put a piece of cardboard in his pocket Pocket, so it would hide the outline of the gun okay. and his hand so no one actually knew that he had a gun so after that after he got there you know after all these coincidences mm -hmm. there was one more coincidence to go and if this one is true it might be the most amazing one of all so the Dakota where John Lennon lived was the setting of Rosemary's Baby mm -hmm. and Rosemary's Baby was directed by Roman Polanski mm -hmm. who was married to Sharon Tate who we all know was murdered by the Manson family. Yeah. And the Manson family, as far as Chapman knew, were supposedly inspired by the Beatles song, Helter Skelter, written by John Lennon. I think you mispronounced Helter Skelter. <laughs> Helter Skelter. I think it was Helter Skelter. Yeah, yeah. Helter Skelter, something like that. So on December 8th, 1980, as Chapman was outside the Dakota, thinking about Rosemary's baby, who should walk by but fucking Mia Farrow? No okay. Who yep. starred in and Rosemary's uh, Baby? It's like every star was just right there. I mean, yeah, it's New York City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a city, it's a city that never sleeps. I heard that. <laughs> I heard that. Chapman said he saw this as the final confirmation that he was making the right decision. Oh my gosh. So at 11 a.m., the linen fan that Chapman had made friends with on Saturday showed up. As Chapman and the fan were talking, a car pulled up in front of the, of the Dakota, and a small child got out. That child was John Lennon's son, Sean. Yeah, the one that he actually chose to pay attention to. Yes, the one he, the one he chose to love, yes. Jesus, dude. God.
We don't have to malign John Lennon right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the one part where I'm like, you know, it's not. Uh... You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. And then you're right. Hey, all right. You're right. Now, the fan was familiar enough with the kid and the nanny to say hello. She actually introduced Mark David Chapman to Sean Lennon. Mark David Chapman smiled at the kid, said he was honored to meet him, and told him, Hey, kid, I've come all the way from Hawaii just to meet your dad. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It was kind of like the time I saw Vince Vaughn walking down the street with the kids, and I was fucking stoned out of my mind. It was like maybe 12 years ago. I was like on the street. He was walking down the street with the kids. Uh, and looked well, up, and I recognized Vincent D'Onofrio with his children. Done for now, I guess. Uh, See ya. He, like, regarded me. And